Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're going to be reading True Living Nightmare Horror Stories. This is going to be volume one of a hopefully recurring theme on this channel. If you like this theme, please make sure to let me know down in the comments section below so that we can make more of these in the future. Also, because of the content in some of these stories, and these stories being more frightening than many of the stories on this channel, I do want to give a content warning before this starts. So, viewer discretion for these stories is strongly advised. Now, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. My high school girlfriend called late one night after I was home and in bed. She said that something had happened and asked if I could come over. She was clearly shaken and not full of details, so I told my parents and drove over towards her house. At the top of her subdivision, I was met by a cop with lights on. He asked where I was going, and I told him about the call from my girlfriend. He lets me go by, and I come over the hill to the cul-de-sac where she lives, and I see multiple cop cars around the circle. They watch me pull up and get out of my car. My girlfriend comes running out of her house and meets me in the street. She explains that someone had broken into her neighbor's house and started beating her with something heavy. The neighbor managed to get out of the house and headed to my girlfriend's house where she started banging furiously on the front door. My girlfriend's dad was out of town, so her mom answered the door and the neighbor just fell into the foyer bleeding profusely from the head. Her mom looks up to see the attacker headed up the walkway towards the front door. She pulls the neighbor into the house and closes the door, hitting the attacker with it before it fully closed. He then took the heavy tool that he had used to beat the neighbor and smashed the little window at the top of the door. Her mom started screaming, and the attacker just turned around and walked up the street into the darkness. I spent the night there that night, along with two or three cops outside in their cars, and in the morning, we could still see the blood pulled on the floor in the foyer and splattered blood above the front door from where the attacker had swung the bloody tool to smash the window. No one was ever caught or even identified. It was just completely random. The neighbor survived, and to my knowledge, had no permanent physical injuries beyond scarring from having her scalp stapled shut. She moved away shortly after the incident. This story kind of creeps me out even to this day, but I have a pretty good one. I lived in Mesa, Arizona when I was 10 years old. We lived in a rough area but I was just a kid, completely ignorant to the dangers of the world. I was walking back home from my friend's house, and my mother wanted me home by 9, and I'd always start walking back at around 8.40 to make sure that I wasn't late. And it's only a couple of blocks from my house, so it wasn't a super long distance. It was around the time of the year when the sun would set at 5.30, and it would be dark well before 7 p.m., so it was very much nighttime. As I'm walking, I hear a woman calling my name. I turn to look and see that it was one of my mom's friends, but she didn't know her too well. However, I just saw that she was familiar and won't say a name, but I turned around and said hello and smiled. She walked up to me and told me my mom had called her and asked her to come get me and ride me back because something happened at my house. She said that it was an emergency and that I needed to go with her and her husband, whom my family was also familiar with. I was only about five minutes from my house, 
but I was told that it was an emergency, and I agreed to go with her. As I'm walking, I get this weird feeling in my gut, and this shaking in my legs that I now today realize was my instincts being on high alert. I stopped for a minute and asked if we could call my mom, and she said that my mother was in the hospital right now and that I needed to hurry. Right as we were opening the door to her car, I hear my mother shout my name as loud as she can, and I turn on a dime quickly, and I walk towards my mom. My mom asked what was going on, and the woman replies and says that she was giving me a ride home because she saw me. That was not the story that she gave me, so I told my mother what she told me and asked what was going on. My mom just looked at me, and she could always tell when I'm lying versus when I was telling the truth. The woman then goes to interrupt me, likely to lie, and my mom cuts her off and just stared back at her with the most shocked look ever and these words still send shivers down my spine. She says in the most shocked voice ever, you were trying to take my son. And the husband looks out the window, hurrying his wife in the car. And as I look back towards them, I can see a syringe on the dashboard leaning against the windshield that he grabs right as I see it. She gets in the car because at that point, my mom was ready to kill her and reached into her purse because she keeps a pocket knife. But they drove away, and right after they did, my mom looked at me and just burst into tears saying, I almost lost you. My mom knew full well what was happening, and I was still too shaken to even say anything, and just hugged her back and we went home. I was still in denial, and to cope, I would convince myself that maybe I wasn't in any danger. My family, of course, never kept in contact with any of them, but my stepdad at the time submitted a tip to the police of the incident. When they caught up with him about three months later, we had found out that he was arrested for having CP on his computer and found restraints in his closet, as well as some containers of propofol. They found pictures of me from my mom's Facebook, downloaded on his computer as well, leading them to believe that I was actually being watched for a good bit. I never liked talking about it because to this day, if I hadn't stopped for those 10 seconds to ask the woman to call my mom, I don't know where I'd be or if I'd even be alive right now making this comment. And while it may seem like something that would have been easily forgotten, it was never the case for me. I haven't even told my closest friends this story, but I might sometime soon. I asked my mom what happened that night, why she came looking for me, She described the same feeling that I remembered feeling moments before I was almost abducted, just a lot sooner than I did, and just had the instinct that I was in danger. I'm not usually a lucky person. It seems the odds are always against me, but I always remember how lucky I was that night that my mom decided to listen to her instincts when I didn't. I've never ignored my instincts since. And every night after that, when I finally did decide to leave my house, my mom would walk with me all the way up until I turned 13 to come back to live with my dad. And that, to date, is the scariest thing I think I've ever experienced. It's some stuff you only hear of on the news, and nobody ever assumed that it'll happen to them. But my life was a mere 20 seconds from being completely different. Up to this day, I'm still looking for a logical explanation to this. This happened in 2003. So I and an ex were checked in, in a coastal resort where the cottages were far apart, like 200 meters away. At around 11 or 11.30 p.m., while we're both drinking beer with the lights turned off and only the TV on, the doorknob suddenly rattled violently, like someone was forcibly trying to get it open. There was no double lock on the door, so my first reaction was to jump from the bed and block the door with my weight. The force of my landing must have been heard from the other side, but the twisting of the doorknob continued. By this time, I was already pressing my face to the floor, 
trying to look and estimate how many people were outside the door via the small gap between the floor and the bottom of the door. There was nothing. Not one pair of feet or anything. But the doorknob just kept rattling. I should point out that the gap between the floor and the door was enough for me to see the outside or, at the very least, notice any change in shadow or light caused by movement. But there was nothing. The turning of the doorknob then stopped, but I never heard any footsteps or any other noise. I waited a few minutes and then opened the door. Everything was quiet. No footprints outside or on the sand surrounding the cottage. We just noped out of there, immediately. The previous story is something very similar to something that happened to me in Indonesia. Only, it was a glass sliding door every side bungalow. Outside sunken bath, a couple of meters of clearance around it in a path. I'd got up really early, 3 a.m., to see the sunrise at the volcano some distance away through jungle and road. I had got back early, maybe 10 a.m. I was so tired I lay on the bed in my shorts curtains open on every side and just fell asleep. I was awoken by this absolutely insane banging on the glass sliding doors. Bear in mind, I could see all around through the glass, but for like the four wooden posts at the corners, but there was nothing there. I jumped, I mean that's a really mild description for what I did, and stood in the middle of the single space just looking for where it was coming from and I could see the windows shaking as they banged. It was proper fast too. Not a regular banging, but bang, 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 bang. Just this uninterrupted salvo of something that I couldn't see hitting the window so hard that the glass was moving. And then it started going around the cabin, banging as it went. Like I say, I could see it bending the glass as it did, though it was hard to track at first just because it was so weird and fast. I darted over to the bedside and called reception, shouting for them to come down. This was a threaded pathway away from the main hotel and its old Dutch colonial building. And they came. It stopped after a few minutes. I waited, still standing. They arrived. And when I told them what it was, the porters and butlers, yeah, it was quite a posh hotel thing, just crouched down and put their hands on their heads and began crying. A couple of them hightailed it right off the car and didn't come back to work. One of them, a lovely guy called Kinang, told me a bunch of stuff about the villagers who had been angry that these cabins had been put up. Apparently only half of them, cabins one through six had been built, but he always gets calls on the switchboard from cabin 12, which is yet unconstructed and when he picks it up, it's just a jumbled hiss and voices. When I was 17, I was hanging out with two friends and they wanted to go smoke weed in the woods. I didn't feel like it, so I drove them and waited in the car. After a while, I was getting bored and decided to go meet them, but there were four paths going off in different directions, so I just took the biggest one. After walking for a few minutes in the pitch black forest, before flashlights on phones, I come across this dip in the trail, and on the other side is a bench lightly visible due to the moonlight. On the bench is sitting a man, and another one is standing in front of him, but I can only make out their silhouette. Being sure these are my friends, I yell out to them before walking over. If you ever walk the woods at night, it's just an uneasy feeling all around, so I was cautious to begin with. Well, it turns out, just after yelling out to my quote-unquote friends, both silhouettes turn around towards me. Not a word. Not a sound. 
the guy sitting down starts sprinting at full speed towards me in complete silence. I got the absolute crap out of there, sprinting also the other way and tripping over stuff because I couldn't see anything. I finally get out and lock myself in my car, but I was really worried for my friends. Maybe a minute later, I see them both coming out of a completely different path. They also confirmed that they never saw me or anyone else. My heart still sinks, thinking about that dude sprinting in silence. Like, what was he going to do? Years ago, I remember sneaking out of my friend's house at night to really do nothing but walk around the neighborhood and hide from car headlights. We were young and bored. There was a homeless camp that was down in some woods off the railroad tracks, not too far from his house. We had seen the trail and knew what was back there. One of the homeless guys that lived there was actually an old friend of my buddy's dad, and he had stopped over a few times and my friend's dad let him shower there and everything. He could have worked if he wanted, but legit told us that he just liked living off the grid. Just wanted to give you some backstory on the reason why we thought it would be cool and safe to go check it out at night. We were a bit nervous at first, thinking what if we get there and his dad's friend isn't there? So we were sneaking up on it. It was a longer walk than we thought, We got kind of close and saw there was a fire going lighting up the woods a bit. We start sneaking closer, but the trail seemed to continue straight while the camp set off the trail to the left. We got, I don't know, maybe around 100 feet from the camp and we looked down the trail and saw a faint silhouette of what we thought was a person. The silhouette looked like it was coming from deeper in the woods towards the camp. We froze and ducked slightly to the side of the trail. I told my friend that I didn't like it, and we should just sneak out. He said he had the same feeling. As I said, the fire at the camp was going just enough to light the area well enough to see. We end up slowly creeping slightly off the trail, back to the railroad tracks. We get probably 30 or 40 or so feet, and I told him that I would rather just hit the trail and slowly walk back because the bushes and trees and everything were hard to navigate, and I would rather be able to see something coming so we could book it out. We played football, and were both pretty fast. We slid out of the brush, and see the silhouette has gotten closer. However, moving further from the fire, the light was dimmer, but we could still make out someone or something was standing there moving closer. My first thought was that maybe they saw us duck into the bushes, and we're coming to check, but it just felt off. My friend and I looked at each other and both mutually and silently decided to pick up the pace. Almost on cue, we both looked back and the silhouette was now booking it towards us absolutely silently. No noise, just fast movement. We hightail it out of there as fast as we can. Thankfully, The trail was wide, so we weren't bumping into each other or anything. Neither of us looked back until we hit the railroad tracks, then hit the railroad track bridge and were on the other side. I looked back as I was slowing down, past the bridge and didn't see anyone. We got back to his house pretty fast, and luckily, that was the end of it. I think I suppressed this story until now, and I can't remember exactly where it happened, but an ex and I went for a romantic weekend out of Jakarta somewhere, a mountain resort surrounded by rice paddies and tea plantations if I remember correctly. It was beautiful and expensive. I was woken up at probably 3 a.m. in the pitch black in our room by some banging on an internal door, and then I heard it slide open. In that split second, I thought it was my ex who couldn't see anything, trying to go to the bathroom. 
Then she sat up and screamed beside me. I crapped myself. I got up, turned all the lights on. The sliding door that we had locked was unlocked and wide open. I thought initially that someone had broken in and we'd startled them, but the outside door was still locked. We noped out immediately as well. We managed to find some other weird reports online, but there wasn't much, and this was back in 2008. We never got an explanation. Only thing I can think of is that someone may have gotten in via a manhole or something, though I never waited around to bother and look. I refuse to believe in supernatural stuff, so it's the only logical thing that I could consider. As I say, I've clearly suppressed it until now. Yeah, Indonesia is no joke. I had an experience there as well. I stayed at one of the biggest hotels in Surakarta. Our room was directly in front of the prayer room. I found it odd that unlike other places where prayers were recited only during prayer times, the verses were ongoing on a loop throughout a day and continued on even at night. I started to get suspicious when we heard things crawling in the ceiling and the air conditioner turning on and off on its own. But hey, these can always be explained by faulty wiring or critters in the ceiling. Although whatever it was sounded much too large for the plaster ceiling. It got worse when it got somewhat rhythmic with the noises in the ceiling, like it was timing its movements with the verses. But whatever, I was tired and decided to just sleep. I woke up at 3 a.m. to see a wispy, shadowy creature hunched over the table with its back to me, eating. When we checked out, I delved deeper into the Google reviews. Half the reviews made reference to spooky things and encounters in the hotel. I was out in California with my wife and daughter. She was about 10 months old at the time, visiting my father-in-law. We drove into the city to hang out. He had to handle a traffic ticket, so we drove to the courthouse. As we drive in, this car is driving into the lot. There was a gate with a guard. Not driving super fast, but too fast for a parking lot. The attendant seemed to be running after the car. We were super confused. The car proceeds to drive into the lot, pick up even more speed. Then the passenger, a woman, opens the door and falls out of the car. We stop our car. We're not in the lot yet, and we were all wondering what the heck is going on. The car stops. The driver hops out and starts chasing the woman. Then all heck breaks loose. She's screaming. He's chasing her. The lot attendant is close behind him. And then I notice the driver chasing her has a knife. The woman passenger runs towards the courthouse, up the steps, and the driver chasing her catches up. Courthouse police are running towards them now. Three of them, guns drawn, yelling at them to stop. The driver tackles the woman. Remember, he has a knife. And as they tussle on the ground, we hear four to five gunshots. I could have sworn they just killed both of them, but the woman jumps up and is quickly ushered into the courthouse by one of the cops. The other two approach the man, guns still drawn, and he writhes around a bit and then goes still. My wife didn't think they were real gunshots. She thought that they were beanbags or something. Thankfully, my daughter was in a rear-facing car seat and had no idea what was going on. We turned around and left. The news later reported the woman was being physically abused by the man, but she convinced him to take her to the courthouse to deal with a speeding ticket or something. She took her chance to get away. He chased her with a knife, and the courthouse cops shot and killed him. I was crazy impressed that they fired into this tangle of two people, and the woman wasn't injured. Still doesn't feel totally real that I watched those cops shoot and kill that guy.
My friend was asleep in her bed when the window next to her was broken open by a burglar. She ran out the door while the burglar was climbing through her window, but he cut himself on the broken glass of the window. He then proceeded to bleed all over her apartment and pass out in her hallway. He died from blood loss in her doorway because the glass cut his femoral artery. The ambulance came and took him away, but he was already deceased by that point. She sent me pictures of her walls and bedroom, and there's just blood everywhere. So basically, my friend had someone die in her apartment in the middle of the night, randomly, and cover her place in blood. She then had to call Hazmat Cleanup to clean the place, and she moved to Canada shortly thereafter. My girl and I were flying into her hometown after being out perusing around the country for Thanksgiving. It was a few days earlier than scheduled, so we didn't tell any of her family or mine, who also flew in, because we had been spending Thanksgiving together for the last few years. We honestly didn't utter a word. This was back in 1992, so there were no cell phones and no tracking abilities or any of that. Anyways, we got into town late at night around 11 p.m. or 12 a.m. We had decided that we were going to stay in a hotel since the plan was to surprise the family and while showing up at their doorstep late at night would have certainly surprised them. That wasn't really the kind that we were going for. We get into our room. It's got a kitchenette, a couch, a TV, a king-size bed. It's all around probably one of the nicer places that we've stayed in. I pass out immediately. She takes a shower. From what she's told me, she lays in bed, unable to sleep until about 2 a.m. For context, we were in an extended stay hotel with a door that led right out into the parking lot. There was a sliding glass door to the left of the bed. Straight ahead was the couch, the door, a desk, and a smaller window. Blinds were shut on the sliding glass door. But on the smaller window, I guess they were open a crack. But when she realized she was too tired, she didn't care all that much. Our room was completely dark, so it wasn't really like anybody could see in any kind of mentality. As she turns over to go to sleep at 2 a.m., through the slightly open blinds at the smaller window, she sees a flash, like a camera flash. But because the parking lot is 50 steps away, she just simply assumes that it's a street light and doesn't think anything of it and falls asleep. 5 a.m. rolls around and I'm woken up to loud knocking on the sliding glass door. She wakes up only a few seconds after I do and is just as confused and disoriented as I am. Continuous, persistent knocking. I had half a mind to just assume that it was some drunkard. It was the holidays after all who had come back from a night out and made a wrong turn somewhere while trying to get back to his room, but was sure that he was where he was supposed to be. Knocking stops briefly, then starts on the front door. I want to further emphasize how this knocking was. Not quite a police knock, but someone was sure that they wanted into this room and wasn't going to stop until they got in. I go over to the door to look through the peephole, and I don't see anybody. The knocking starts again on the sliding glass door. If it was someone trying to wake up whoever they were with because they got locked out of their room, wouldn't they be announcing themselves? Wouldn't they be calling out the name of the person that they were trying so desperately to wake up? Like I said, the knock wasn't quite police, so I know that it wasn't them. They would have made sure that everyone knew they were there had it been. I go back to the sliding glass door and stand there. The knocking persists. Once it stops, I peel the curtain back just enough that I can see out the window. I'm pretty blind without contacts and didn't have my glasses on, so I'm practically pressing my face up to the glass to see who I can see. And I see nobody. The second that I shut the blinds, the knocking starts again. At this point, I'm freaked out. I was trying to keep my composure as to not make my girl unsettled. 
but we're both already past that point. Nobody knows that we're here. Nobody that would want to pull a prank on us. None of our family, our friends, nobody. The only person that knows we're here was the older man who checked us in. And why the heck would he care where we are? I'm borderline a little worried for our safety. If whoever was out there managed to get in and had cruel intentions upon entering, I'm a small guy. I'm five foot eight and 125 pounds soaking wet. I can talk a lot of crap and can throw a punch. But if somebody bigger than I really wants to kick my butt, they'll be able to do it no problem. I call up to the front desk as the knocking doesn't stop. And on the second ring, the man who checked us in answers and seemed concerned as to why I'm calling at this hour. I explain the situation. The knocking is still happening as I'm on the phone. And he tells me that he's going to send a security guard over to check it out. The knocking continues on for about another minute. Not even probably two or three minutes after the knocking stops, I get a call back from the front desk who says that security didn't see anybody didn't see any signs of anybody, but that he apologizes for whatever happened. Super comforting. Neither one of us fell back asleep until it was light out, and when we went out later in the day, there was a singular footprint leading away from the sliding glass door. Weird, because we were in a nice part of town. It was a place that she grew up in and therefore felt safe in, knowing the area as well as she did. That's one of the reasons we chose to stay at this place. It was horrible. We are both still stumped as to what the situation was. I don't know. I still get uncomfortable just thinking about it. Really. This is a story my mom tells me all the time. When I wasn't even six months old, my dad was out of town on a work trip and my mom was home alone with me and my older brother. The house was kind of isolated and had a gravel driveway with one of those doorbell things where it would ring the doorbell whenever someone drove or walked close enough to the garage. At 11.30 p.m., my mom hears the chime and wakes up. She knows that my dad isn't due home for two more days so she's positive that it isn't him. She grabs a shotgun and sets in the hallway that leads to the front door. Someone jiggles the handle, and my mom makes a point to loudly pump the shotgun and tells the person that she's aiming it at the door. Then she heard the chime go off again and hears them running down the driveway. That was it. The next day, she heard sirens whiz past the house towards the neighbor's place. They'd been found stabbed to death in their bed, the police assumed that the murderer had either come by my house either before or after they'd killed our neighbors. My mom's friend's friend went on a Tinder date with a dude and they met at a lunch place and things were going great. After the date, the guy asks if she wanted to have coffee at his place, and the date had been going great, so she said yes. They go to his place, and as soon as they are inside his apartment, he closes the door and locks it, and turns to her and says, You're not leaving this apartment alive. She freaks out, and quickly ran to the closest door. She got lucky, and it's the toilet. As soon as she had locked the door, she sends her location to all of her contacts and tells them to call the emergency number for our country. Then she calls the police. The police arrive, and the dude has almost completely hacked the bathroom door to pieces with an axe. She is still inside, completely terrified and panicked. Once the police get the dude under control, they sent in an EMT to calm her down and get her out. When they take her out from the bathroom, the police tell her not to look to her left, but of course she had to look. The whole apartment, from ceiling to floor and walls, were covered in thick plastic, and there were a bunch of tools on the floor. 
He had it planned meticulously and she got incredibly lucky to be leaving alive. This is going to be a somewhat long and controversial story, but it happened to me. I was driving home from visiting a friend who lived several hours away from me, six hours to be exact. I hadn't seen my friend in a very long time, and instead of leaving early from my visit, like I should have, I left their place at like 8 p.m. I messaged my husband when I left and told him not to wait up for me, as I wouldn't be home until almost 3 a.m., we said goodnight, and he told me to drive safely. The highways that I would take to get home aren't major thoroughfares. I live in rural Canada, so 90% of my drive would be on small two-lane highways. It's actually a beautiful drive through gorgeous countryside. So I'm into my drive about four hours when things get weird. I'm literally in the middle of nowhere when my GPS starts acting up. After about five minutes, the thing literally just dies on me. No problem though, I'll just use my phone. No sooner did I load the directions on my phone and it starts acting up. The screen flashing on and off, the coordinates started spinning, really weird stuff. Then, just like the GPS, it just died. Still not a huge deal. I'm only a couple of hours from home. I can find my way. So I turn on the radio. I had been listening to music on my phone, but it died. Normally, at this distance from the city, you can still pick up a station or two. But nothing. Just this really weird static. It was the most beautiful, calm, clear summer night. And the stars were so vivid when you're out of the city. But literally, out of nowhere, this weird green fog started to appear. As I continued driving, the fog got thicker to the point where I'm only driving like 40 kilometers per hour on a highway that I was literally doing 120 on. Then, literally out of nowhere, my car died while driving. I drove a standard, so I just threw it in neutral to coast as far as possible. When I finally came to a complete stop, the fog was so thick that it was actually in the car. I could barely see my hands on the steering wheel, and it had a terrible taste. Next thing I know, it's daylight out, and I'm being yelled at by two CN workers. I was still in a daze. It was almost like I was frozen. The workers are screaming at me. I guess my car is parked on private railroad property. They ask how I got past security with my car, why I'm there. I couldn't answer. I literally had no idea where I was. They told me to get out before they call the cops and file trespassing charges. I tried to explain what happened. I told them that the car died on the side of the highway. I went to start my car to show them that it was dead, and after some heavy hesitation it finally started. I couldn't believe where I was. I was literally inside of a CN rail yard. How did I get here? There was a nine foot fence surrounding the compound and a locked security gate at the front. I asked the worker where I was and when he told me I was in disbelief. I was at least a hundred kilometers from where I last remembered. As I'm driving out, I instantly remembered my husband. He must be worried sick. What time is it even? How the heck did I get here? My phone was still completely dead, so I couldn't message him. When I finally got home, it was 3 p.m. I tried to explain what happened to my husband, and he was in total disbelief. We both were. The next day, I went to the phone store to see if my phone could be fixed. They said it might take a week or so, but it was repairable. The very next day, I noticed something was wrong. I felt like crap. My hair seemed to be falling out, and I started to get a really bad rash. So we went to the hospital. I told the hospital what happened to me a couple days earlier, and they thought that I was joking. It wasn't until my blood work came back an hour later that they took me seriously. I had radiation poisoning. They immediately put me in an isolated room. 
I spent a total of 21 days in the hospital before I was deemed non-radioactive. And when I got my phone back from the cell phone company, the last time my GPS pinged, it said I was 4,000 feet in the air. I don't know, but I think I may have been abducted. I was 17, taking the metro from the suburbs to Chicago at 8 p.m. alone. So this was like 2011. I was reading my book and heard a loud sound behind me. I turned around, and a man, about 40, was looking at me with his bag on the ground in front of him. He picked it up and sat next to me, blocking me from exiting and sort of pushing me into the window. I was alone in the car except for the conductor, who left within a few minutes. The man began talking to me, saying that when I turned around, I was more beautiful than he thought I'd be. He said we could have a life together, but it'd be hard, since people would talk about our age difference. I said I wasn't interested. As we pulled into the station, he grabbed my arm hard and said, don't scream, I have a weapon. He was walking me off the train into the crowd, holding my arm. Behind me, I heard the conductor shout after me, miss. You forgot your book. And the man let go of me and ran away. I ran to the conductor and was crying. He said he thought the man was my father and had no idea. I was on my way to catch another bus, so I just sort of numbly ran off, looking in every direction until I was on my next bus. I never told my parents, because I didn't want them to not let me travel to see my boyfriend at the time, now my husband. Anyways, don't set in the empty train car. I used to sleepwalk when I was a child. We lived in a rough neighborhood, Decatur, Georgia, and I would wake up outside in the middle of the night, not knowing how I got there and would have to walk home and walk into the darkened doorway I had left wide open for whoever might be lurking around. However, the time that scared me the most was when I was about nine years old. I woke up and found myself with the bedroom curtains drawn, back, and staring out the window. As I came awake, I noticed a very large and completely hairless man, no hair, eyebrows, etc., staring at me and slowly inching closer to the window and closer to my face. He was looking bewildered, like he wasn't sure what he was seeing. At that moment, I realized what was going on and started screaming uncontrollably, frozen in place and peeing down my leg. The man freaked out and screamed, did a tumbling move, and then ran off in a weird zigzag like he was trying to dodge bullets. My mom woke up and thought I probably had a nightmare. The next morning, we found a screwdriver on the front porch and damage to the door jam and door handle. I still just about pee my pants when I tell that story, but now it's usually from laughing. I will never forget the look on his face when I started coming to life and screaming for his high-pitched scream and his duck and roll, dodging and bobbing all the way down the street. I was active duty in the Navy, served aboard a submarine. We were in port one day. Most of the crew had left. The guys on duty for the night were given permission to bring our kids on board for dinner. Halfway through the meal, someone makes an 4MC announcement. 4MC is the emergency announcement intercom thing. Says there's light smoke in the engine room, quickly followed by fire in the engine room. We train for this stuff religiously, so everyone is immediately in action. The commanding officer is still there, but topside. One of our senior enlisted guys apparently ran the kids up front to a hatch where he was quite literally throwing them through the hatch as our CO caught them and sat them on the deck topside. The rest of us ran toward the fire, 
and I see no one grabbing a mask. Not one person. So I grab a big handful of breathing masks and follow through the hatch where we're greeted by what appeared to be light smoke filling the entire engine room. But it didn't smell like smoke. It was sweet and tasted sweet. An oil pump had blown and filled the entire back half of the boat with automized hydraulic fluid. A guy was moments from lighting a torch in the engine room, as the casualty was called. Had it been called just a moment later, we'd have walked into an inferno. Had he for some reason not heard it called and lit the torch after we had run in, we'd have been on fire before we could react. It all turned out perfectly fine, cleaned the oil that clung to the surfaces and fixed the pump, but it was somewhat surreal, understanding just how close we were to a wildly different result. I was with a guy for a couple of years when I realized that he'd taken up smoking meth as a hobby after work. We had numerous problems already, and I had three small kids, so I finally kicked him out. A few days later, maybe a week, he makes a fake Facebook page and sends me a friend request. The only posts on the page were talking about killing me and my children, his self unaliving, and how he planned to do it that day. The most recent post was accompanied by a selfie of him in my backyard, a recent selfie, so he had been there. I was on my way home with the kids late in the evening when I got the request. I had stopped by my parents' home the day before and gotten my dad's 9mm handgun because he was sending messages through mutual friends about burning my house down. I called the police as soon as I got home, and they didn't seem to think it was a big deal and didn't have an officer available to come check my house before we walked into it. I live in the middle of the woods, and we have a rinky-dink police force. Anyway. I made the kids stay in the car. I gave my oldest instructions on what to do if anything happened, and I had to sweep my own home in the dark with a 9mm just in case he was in there waiting for me and my children, and it was terrifying. I had to check my entire house every time we came home for a while, and I was always worried that I'd eventually find him there. Police were called numerous times, and I was eventually granted a restraining order a couple of weeks later when the death threats continued. He died about a year ago, and all I felt was relief. In the early to mid-90s in Northern Ireland, I was a kid of around eight or nine, the sun was shining and it was sometime in the early afternoon. My dad needed to return a library book in the Crumlin Road, a Protestant loyalist area in Belfast. We were Catholics, and the Crumlin Road was notoriously dangerous at the time, still is to a lesser extent. So I was already a little on edge, just knowing the reputation of the place. My dad was cool though, didn't seem worried or anything. It's not like we have Catholic printed on our foreheads. He did say, however, that I had to pretend to have a different name if anyone asked me. My name is one which marks you as a Catholic, so I adopted a Protestant name for the trip. We came to a road which led to an intersection, across which was a predominantly Catholic Republican enclave called the Ardoin Road. We were headed to the right, down a long, winding path, but further up the road ahead, towards the intersection, we could see a group of men. One of them was running back and forth across the road, relaying information between two pockets of people. Some were staring across the road towards the Catholic area. Some were talking to a man in a parked but running car. One in particular stuck out. He had long hair and a leather jacket and was very tall, at least compared to the other men. It all looked suspicious even to me as a child, although I didn't know why. But my dad's demeanor changed to a more serious and quiet one and I took it as confirmation that we weren't safe. He was from Belfast. We were living in a town outside of Belfast at the time, and grew up when things were at their worst here, so he knew the ropes, 
and knew the signs that something was happening. We weren't walking towards the men, so it wasn't a problem. We crossed to the right and started walking away. This is when a woman approached us. She was middle-aged with short red hair. She saw us coming and made a purposeful beeline towards us. She seemed preoccupied, nervous. She started grilling my dad immediately asking who he was and where he was coming from. She was talking in a, I'm trying my best to sound casual, but I'm failing manner. I could feel my entire body beginning to boil with fear, and I felt as though I was mere moments away from being discovered. It was like a horror movie where someone finds themselves in a small town where everyone is in a cult or something, and they're trying to blend in but are drawing suspicion and are losing themselves in an ever-increasing paranoia. I suddenly had visions of my dad getting shot and me screaming over his corpse, maybe even getting shot myself despite being a child. The longer my dad and the woman talked, the more I was starting to lose the ability to hear, as though my head was underwater. I was holding my dad's hand, and I was struggling to keep a grip because of the sweat pumping out of my palm. I didn't know how or why, but something primal in me recognized that we were in serious danger. It was clear that she was a part of whatever was going on around the corner and was trying to manage and analyze the flow of foot traffic, especially that of strangers like us. Given that she and us were the only people on the street, she had been doing a good job. She was fishing hard for information about us. My dad played it cool and responded to her questions without really revealing much, doing a much better job of being casual than she was. The area we were from, he explained, was mixed, i.e. Protestant and Catholic, and he feigned displeasure at that fact, trying to signal that he hated Catholics and was somewhat miffed to have to live amongst them, without ever actually using those words. It was subtle, and I was terrified that I might need to participate in the conversation, because there's no way I could dance around the truth, as well as my dad was doing. He explained that he was just here to return a book, which he showed her as proof. She asked about me, my name, and I gave her the fake name. She surely read the terror in my face and could hear it in my voice. My dad decided that that was the time to break off and say, nice to meet you, all the best, and started walking away with me. I could sense that the woman didn't budge and just stood and stared at us as we walked away. I glanced over my shoulder after about 30 seconds and just caught a glimpse of her turning and walking towards the road where the men were gathered. We rounded a corner, and were now at the top of a very long and steep road path, with the library at the very bottom of it. The path was fenced on one side, and on the other side was a row of houses. It felt like we were walking deeper into danger, and that we had only two routes of escape, keep going or turn back the way we came. About partway down the road, we realized we were being followed, my dad told me to run ahead and check that the library was opened, and I hesitated. He said it was okay and to just go and check. I glanced over my shoulder. It was the man in the leather jacket with the long hair. I did what my dad wanted and ran ahead, heart pounding and ears pricked, awaiting the crack of gunfire. I checked the door was opened, and I ran back up. As I was coming back, I saw that the man in the leather jacket had turned and was making his way back up the road. My dad looked unfazed, but was walking with a certain rigidity, like something had happened in the time it took me to run to the library and back again, and he hadn't quite unclenched his fists yet. He said it was okay and we were safe. I asked about the man following us. He said he sent me ahead, and when I was a safe distance away, he stopped and turned around to face him, ready for whatever happened. He said he was expecting violence, but as he turned around, the leather jacket dude immediately put his head down, turned, and walked back the way he came. My dad watched him for a few seconds, and then started making his way back towards me. That afternoon, within the hour we were there, a Catholic taxi driver was murdered in that street. The vibes that something terrible was going to happen were justified, and I've never felt as terrified as I did that day. When the news about the taxi driver was on TV that night, I knew I had seen the planning of a murder, and I knew we had walked into the middle of it. I could probably have identified both the woman and the leather jacket man, 
had I been asked about them by the police, but that was never going to happen. No way my dad would have volunteered himself, and therefore me, to the cops, to be a witness against a terrorist cell. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Get a good night's sleep, everyone. And I'll read to you in the next video. Bye-bye now.